21st, 2023, uh, meeting of the Planning Commission meeting is hereby called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Thank you, Chair. We'll start off with Chair Klein. Here. Vice Chair Fortney. Here. Commissioner Vargas. Here. Commissioner Lightfoot. Here. Commissioner Labonte is absent. Commissioner Rudin. Here. And Commissioner Wilker Wilkerson. Here. Chair, we have a quorum. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, will the Vice Chair please uh, call the Pledge of Allegiance? to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice Chair Courtney. Um, at this time, I'll ask staff if there are any communications or announcements for this evening's meeting. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. We do not have any supplemental communications this evening. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Um, Next item is approval of the agenda. If there are no changes, do I have a motion and then a second to approve the agenda? Moved by Commissioner Wilkerson, seconded by Commissioner um, Rudin. Um, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, we have a, 
approval of the agenda. Now go to item five, business from the floor. This portion of the agenda is available for the public to address the planning commission on any issue that is not on the agenda. There will be a limit of three minutes per speaker. At this time, I welcome anyone who wishes to address the commission regarding a topic or issue that is not on the agenda this evening uh, to please approach the podium. Uh, with that, we will go ahead and close business from the floor and move to uh, the next item, which is the consent, the consent calendar. Uh, we have one item on consent, which are the minutes from the December 6, uh, 2022 meeting. Does anyone from the commission or the public wish to pull any items from the consent uh, agenda? Okay, so with that, we will... Um, do I have a motion uh, to approve the consent calendar? That's been moved by Commissioner Rudin. Is there a second? Second. Second by Com Commissioner uh, who was that? Vargas. <laughs> I didn't know. If it, it, could, I, it could have been Ralph. I don't know. Okay, Var Commissioner Vargas. Thank you. Um, uh, will the clerk please call? The, uh, yes, Chair. Yeah, Can we start off with Chair Klein? Yes. Vice Chair Fortney? Yes. Commissioner Vargas? Yes. Commissioner Lightfoot? Yes. Commissioner Labonte? Absent. Commissioner Rudine? And Commissioner Wilkerson? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. So we'll now move to uh, our next item on the agenda. Um, let's see. Public hearing? Yeah, okay. Sorry, I think my paper came out of order here. Okay, so the uh, we are now at the public hearing. Of, our first item will be the Vanden Cove subdivision project. Uh, we will first hear presentation by staff, followed by commissioner questions, and then we will open it up for public comment. Uh, the presentation for this will be coming to us from uh, planning manager Piman Bavan. Uh, may you please have the staff presentation. Good evening, Chair, Planning Commissioners. Thank you. Uh, the item for you tonight is the Vanden Cove subdivision, which is a proposal to construct a 114-unit single-family home subdivision on approximately 27 acres, uh, concealed three properties, three existing properties on Vanden Road. Um, the applications are mitigated negative declaration, uh, tender subdivision map, and a plan development. This is an aerial of the uh, of the proposed project site. Um, it's easy to see the three parcels laid out here. Um, the portion to the north is the Vandengate subdivision, which we talked about in the staff report as an approved project uh, from uh, about 42 units. Um, so just quickly, I want to talk about the general plan designation. The general plan designation is residential low density, which is 3.1 to 5 units an acre uh, for signal family residential. That is what the project is proposing. Um, their density is roughly 4.27, 4.28. Um, so it's within what the general plan allows. So that project is consistent with the general plan. And I mentioned that because if you look at the zoning map designation, the zoning is AG, which is agricultural. And this is simply a matter of um, some inconsistencies with our, with our maps that will be corrected. But under the um, Housing Accountability Act, as long as a project complies with the general plan designation, it can move forward. There is no need to actually change the zoning before they can go forward with the project. So that's why you don't see a zoning a rezoning request with this project. So briefly, the Housing Accountability Act and SP 330, uh, it applies to residential developments uh, with multiple units and mixed use projects. There are restrictions. Um, cities cannot require rezoning if it's consistent with the general plan, as I just mentioned. And that's really important because I think um, there, there were some questions um, in our neighborhood meeting or questions that came up regarding, well, if this is zone ag, how is it not changing zoning? That's why the zone change isn't required. Um, it does lock in development standards at the time of uh, the pre-application submittal. Uh, a preliminary review was submitted for this project back in uh, 2021, and that's when uh, those development standards were locked in at that time. Um, and it's uh, you know, development standard general plan policies and anything that would be subject to uh, review by the city. Uh, the project uh, projects that do comply with those standards um, cannot be denied or, or, or lower density cannot be applied to it as long as it's complying with those. A brief summary of the project, as I mentioned, roughly 27 acres, 26.7 acres, 114 units. 
Uh, the density is 4.3 dwelling units an acre. Uh, the lot size right now being proposed between 6,000 and 11,000 square feet and four house plants consisting of one and two story units. Uh, the floor areas that are being proposed are roughly 2,000 to 3,300 square feet. Uh, the different styles are Tuscan, Craftsman, uh, and French Cottage. The project does include, if you look at the map, which I'll go into a little more detail, does include a detention basin uh, for the project and access is provided both via its own um, connection points to Vannon, but also through the Vannon Gate subdivision to the north and emergency vehicle access provided to um, Alamo Place to the east. So this is a closer look at the, um, at the proposed layout of the subdivision. Again, two access points, B Street and D Street onto Vanden, and then the emergency vehicle to uh, Purple Martin Drive, which is in the Allen Place subdivision. This shows a project site uh, with Vanden Gate. And again, Vanden Gate is an approved project. Um, how they sort of proceed with the infrastructure, that's sort of a, a combined uh, effort. Uh, and that's why they've sort of held off until this project's gone through its development review process. But again, Maverick Drive is the main con the shared connection point to Vanden Gate. Um, this is just an example of the, uh, the proposed uh, house plan designs. Uh, they are well designed. They do meet the city's residential design guidelines when it comes to single family homes. There's a lot of uh, different uh, materials and articulations and elevations. And uh, so from that perspective, the project definitely um, does provide the sort of house plans that, that the code requires, but also some that staff has been eager to, uh, to see in some subdivisions. In terms of compliance with city policies and standards, uh, the general plan policies are, those were identified in more detail in the staff report, just a summary of it. It does provide housing infrastructure for future residents. It will pay its fair share uh, uh, costs for infrastructure improvements. Um, in terms of zoning ordinance, it does comply with the relative, with the applicable development standards. Um, residential development standards, I mentioned, it does meet those sort of um, uh, quality architecture uh, elements that we want to see. And in terms of environmental analysis, they did admit, they prepared to mitigate a negative declaration to comply with CEQA. Um, the CEQA document itself, um, it, as with every project, there is some impacts that are, that are created by the project, but they are mitigated to less than significant. Um, those would be um, air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, geology and soils, uh, hydrology and water quality, and noise. Um, there was a, uh, the staff report includes, uh, again, that, that document or link to it um, that has a lot more information. Um, in terms of circulation period, that was done last year, uh, starting uh, December 9th to January 9th. The only comments that we got were from the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board. And again, the staff board has the responses to those. Primarily, the comments either didn't really apply to the project or they uh, pointed out things that the project was already doing and is required to do. Um, but certainly as a project, if the project is approved and they get into uh, sort of a more detailed design of the subdivision, then, uh, then that would, that would, some of those items would be clarified for compliance with, with, with the state regulations. So, uh, but again, a summary is included in your staff report. So the city had a neighborhood meeting on December 19th. Uh, it was held via Zoom. Um, 600 foot radius was what we noticed. Uh, 279 notices were mailed, 17 attendees, which included residents and staff. Uh, really a summary of the comments were related to connectivity, uh, traffic impacts, vehicle miles traveled, emergency vehicle access, and any sort of plans for regional evacuation in case of emergency. Um, again, the staff will provide a response. We provide a response to those items in the staff report itself. Um, uh, for your review. In terms of the conclusion, uh, we do support the project. It, it meets required findings for approval. It complies with general plan and zoning uh, in terms of development standards, complies, complies with applicable development standards, provides additional single family home options. They are well-designed homes and they are providing uh, improvements such as widening Vanden Road and constructing a new pedestrian bridge over uh, New Al Alamo Creek, which is, um, is a big deal. Uh, our recommendations that by simple motion, the Planning Commission adopt mitigated negative declaration for Vanden Cove subdivision and approve the tentative subdivision map and plan development for Vanden Cove uh, subject to the conditions of approval. Um, and that concludes my presentation. I just wanna let the commission know that um, the applicants and staff from uh, FIRE, from Traffic Engineering and from our Public Works are available to answer any questions.
Yeah. Uh, tw yes. I'm sorry. Is there an error in that? I apologize for that. Yes. It, we, we didn't go to the future, so it, ha it, it happened last year. I apologize. Bridge will be for everybody that's not aware of what's so, going to be that the pedestrian so, bridge. Yeah, so the pedestrian. Yeah, if you look at the project side, if you look along the sort of the west side, if you just come down Bannon Road, right as you cross Alamo, New Alamo Creek, that's what pedestrian bridge would be. Which will tie Bannon Road in, so they don't have to walk on this. That's right. Yes. I'd walk the test there, and then to the east there, you got what is between lots? I think it's forty-four and forty-five. That's the emergency. For 45, view. that's an emergency? Yes. Okay, perfect. So that would connect to Alamo Place. So to the south of that, between lots 45 and 44, it looks like. Oh, I see. Is it emergency access? But it looks like it goes to yeah. Swaz property to the creek. No, we could have the applicant speak to that. Okay, yeah. when the time comes. That's my only question. Uh, we're, we're I, I think uh, we'll... Yeah, right, you're the applicant? Yes, sir. Chris, Cam Chris Cameron's all Discovery Engineers. Yeah, I, if you don't, I'm going to uh, finish Commissioner questions, and then we'll... Um, I'll, oh, I'm sorry. You I thought right you call me up. No, absolutely. I totally understood. L let me uh, just finish with our Commissioner questions. Um, Vice Chair Courtney? That's everything. Thank okay. you. Commissioner Dean? Or, or... I have a question for the applicant whenever the applicant comes up. Okay. I see um, that this project's going to tie into New Alamo Creek. Is there going to be any impact on Alamo Creek with this? So those, so those are some of the comments that, that we receive from the state to make sure whatever work is done, they obtain all the appropriate permits. So again, the project itself, there are state law that the project has to comply with. But again, once those, pro once those um, infrastructure plans are, um, are finalized, then they would obtain all the permits that are required. Okay. Yeah. And so that, but that won't have any impact. Uh, going back into the city with New Alamo Creek, it'll just be going forward. If there were any, because all the water is going to go there and then continue to go out, correct? Uh, yes, but uh, did I? <laughs> so, so again, they would need to obtain um, state water quality permits. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Which permits exactly would depend on how the, the infrastructure? And, and I only ask because, as we know, every once in a while, Alamo floods. And so I'm just curious, just making sure we have all our bases covered regarding that. Just we just went through that recently. So yep. just thank you. To speak to address the commission and then we'll open up to public comment. Good evening, uh, Chair Klein, Commissioners, Chris Camerzel, Discovery Builders. Um, uh, first off, I'd just like to thank Taman for a great uh, presentation, and also, in particular, Albert and Chris Joy, uh, uh, in engineering, who uh, really helped, uh, you know, worked with our, our consultants and our designers to kind of tailor a project that uh, I think, you know, turned out pretty well and has got a lot of benefits for the city. So, a um, couple of questions I heard uh, regarding the, um, on the southeast corner, the, the north to south, corridor you see there, that's a connection for an existing city water main that uh, crosses New Alamo Creek from the south side. So that's, we're going to um, dedicate that to the city and it will be available for the city to access and maintain that water uh, line that's existing. And uh, what else, what, what other question did we have? This question regarding water quality. Uh, you'll notice on the, also in that same general vicinity, a uh, couple of water quality and detention basins that are designed specifically to sort of meter the uh, the runoff from the site to less you know, a pre-development level so um, those will be designed those are will be in place and will function and 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 serve to uh, you know for flood control measures so gotcha um, what I'd like to do is uh, I, we had questions from Commissioner Rudine, so I don't want to uh, gloss over those. And uh, Commissioner Wilkerson's question about the water flight, I think, is what you're alluding to. Um, John, did you want to follow up before we move on? on, on the water, um, how, how far apart are the homes off of Purple Martin uh, and, and their uh, backyards and, and the basin? 
Well, those those houses um, they have a minimum twenty foot setback, but you can see uh, there's a there's an enhanced setback for those existing homes along there. And then I think there's fifteen to eighteen feet okay. from that property line to the edge of the basin. So there there'll be an access road, a three hundred sixty degree access road that provides um, you know city maintenance vehicles access around the entire perimeter of the basin. And then in addition to that, there'll be new fencing and a landscape strip. So there's quite a buffer there. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Commissioner Rudin. Hi, uh, my question is more of kind of relaying feedback that I've heard when uh, people asking me. Um, I, I think this beautiful project, I'm curious if you guys had considered other type of housing uh, other than single family. Uh, no, we didn't. And just that it, it kind of fits the character of the surrounding neighborhoods. Everything out there is uh, residential low density, six to six to 7,000 square foot. So it just sort of matches the existing character. And uh, I think that it's a product. It enables us to build sing, uh, single story homes as well, which are we're super desirable right now. And I think there's a market for those. So right. um, just you know, kind of matches the character of the surrounding. That's what I assumed. I just kind of wanted to pass along the question that I've been asked a few times. So. Commissioner Rudin, uh, was that it? Um, other questions for the, or other commissioner questions for the developer? Anything else? Uh, nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We'd now like to open the floor for public comment. Uh, this is the time for uh, the public to uh, uh, have public comment be closed because there's nobody. To address them. Excellent. So no public comment. Um, we'll close public comment, and we'll uh, bring the matter back to um, the commission for deliberation. Um, with that, um, I'll entertain a motion, and then we can go into discussion. Um, unless I, I, I see anything else. Okay, yes, but Vice Chair Fortney, please. Okay, by simple motion, adopt the mitigated negative declaration and approve the tentative subdivision map and plan development for the Van de Cope subdivision located at 5742, 5750, and 7038 Vanden Road, subject to the conditions of approval. Second. I'll second that. It's been moved by Vice Chair Fortney, seconded by Commissioner Vargas, I heard. Um, with that, uh, we'll open the floor for discussion. Um, and I'm just gonna go, go around Wilkerson. Green, we're good. Okay, will the clerk please call the roll. Chair Klein. Yes. Vice Chair Fortney. Yes. Commissioner Vargas. Yes. Commissioner Lightfoot. Yes. Commissioner Levante is absent. Commissioner Rudine. Yes. And Commissioner Wilkerson. Yes. And the motion passes. Great. Thank you. Um, commend the staff uh, and thank the developer for bringing the project. Thank you. With that, we'll move forward with uh, our next item, uh, uh, an update on the California Housing Law uh, Memorandum with uh, our Assistant Director, uh, Clerk Extraordinaire. Thank you, Chair Klein. We're actually going to um, do the 2022 general plan annual report first. Okay. Before we talk about the housing laws, uh, while staff is getting. Or Thank you so much. Uh, again, I'm Assistant Director uh, Joshua Montemere for the Community Development Department. With me this evening presenting is our advanced planning team, Assistant, Assistant Planner Edward Lincoln and Senior Planner Tara Hayes. So the 2002 general plan annual report, um, which I will be introducing, um, is something that's culminated uh, over the last year, oh, sorry, over the last few months, we put together a really grand report for you. On the dais, you'll find a printed copy of just the narrative portion of that report, including Appendix 5, which I'll go into more detail. So now that we have the presentation launched, I will go ahead and jump right into it. So beginning with the roadmap, I just want to start off by introducing, um, I'll start off by introducing what the 2002 General Plan Annual Report is. And then I'll pass it off to Edward, who will lead the Celebrate Housing portion of this presentation, and then Tyra will finish it off with the 2002 General Plan Annual Report. There are 40 slides, but we'll move rather quickly <laughs> this evening, and we'll break in the middle for a present in the middle of the presentation for questions. You know, um, I'll just uh, comment. Um, hopefully, the last time um, we'll save questions for the for for 
Com commissioner questions till the end, hopefully. Sounds good. Yeah, so Great. we also have a break in the middle in case it's to give you a little breathing <laughs> okay. and to ask questions. So I'll just kick it off first with um, a brief overview of what the general plan report is. Um, and I'll periodically reference in the presentation as the APR. And the APR is prepared in-house every year by staff and is prepared for the State Governor's Office of Planning and Research, as well as the Department of Housing and Community Development. And even though this document is prepared for the state, this document is also a very useful tool for our public who is interested in the general plan and in housing. And the general plan annual report also contains the housing element annual report. And both of these reports are required by the state and should be filed by April 1st. So in reading what the general plan annual report is, it's basically divided up into appendices and sections. And um, compared to previous years, this year received a pretty significant facelift. Um, that's because we wanted to achieve a very uniform document that covers the housing element, the downtown specific plan, the energy and conservation measures, and the general plan EAR and mitigation monitoring program. So printed also in on the dais for you is Appendix 5, which is the noteworthy report that we created this year to celebrate housing. And what it is, it's a, Basically what it says is celebrating housing uh, in, over the last RENA cycle. And the last RENA cycle is referenced as RENA 5 and it ca captures the beginning of 2021 and ended at the end of 2022. And before I hand it over to Assistant Planner Lincoln, I just wanted to briefly highlight all the useful information that you'll find in section Appendix 5, where we've curated multiple graphs, charts, photos of different housing types um, that are very useful to showcase how Vacwell has exceeded the RENA allocation, uh, which was designated by ABAG Associated Bay Area Council of Governments, which was only 1,084, and Vacaville surpassed that by producing 3,338 3, units over the last renewal cycle. So with that, I'll segue it into the first part of our presentation to, of Celebrate Housing and hand it over to Edward. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see everybody. Um, the first slide we have here uh, is for uh, residential permits overall annually uh, for 2015 through 2022. Um, which represents the fifth cycle for the housing element. Um, as you can see, there's a trend from 2015 to 2018 where it kind of declines and then we peak at 2020 and then it uh, starts to decline again, but we consistently stay above 200 residential permits. Um, this next graph, uh, we break it down by type of residential permits. Uh, the blue representing single family and the red representing multifamily and the green representing ADUs. Um, you'll see that in 2020, um, multifamily played uh, a part that it traditionally for the city of Vacaville didn't play. And also um, ADUs from 2020 start to increase as well. And you could kind of attribute that to the state and our code our code, I'm sorry, which makes it easier for um, the citizens to come in and um, apply for ADUs. Uh, this third graph represents uh, permits by district. Um, as you can see, multifamily is represented 100% by District 3, um, and single family um, is split between, well, the, the the, the, the higher totals are split between District 2 and District 6. And then we also have uh, the ADUs, which are represented by every district. Uh, this map represents the subdivisions for the residential permits. And as you can see, uh, every district is represented with this map and the place of those uh, subdivisions and the permits. Uh, Going to this map, we're starting with District 1. Uh, we see that Cheyenne, uh, the Reserve of Browns Valley, and North Village are represented here. Uh, we have some pictures. Um, we have North Village, uh, which you have a variety of housing types from um, American traditional craftsmen, um, Spanish colonial, um, various different types. Uh, and. <clears throat> sizes of the lots. Uh, also, we have the Cheyenne and Browns Valley, the Reserve of Browns Valley, um, which are bigger lots, um, more executive type housing. And also the lower slide to the bottom right, uh, we also have 
a lot where you have an ADU, which is sitting on top of the garage. So just to get an idea of uh, the different kind of things you can do for ADUs. Uh, next, we move to District 2, um, where we have Brighton Landing and Roberts Ranch. Uh, with these two uh, subdivisions, we have similar types of developments. We have a uh, single story, um, also with two story houses, um, similar lot size ranging, ranging from 3,600 to 6,000 in square footage. Um, And then we fall into District 3, which highlights all of the multifamily developments. Um, we have the Strata Apartments. We have the Harbors and Townhomes. <clears throat> and we also have uh, Rocky Hill Apartments and the Pony Express, which represents some of our affordable housing, um, lower income uh, seniors and veterans. And uh, also something to highlight for these uh, developments is that they are a part of the Allison Priority Development uh, Area. So that means that their transit plays a, an important part for this particular area. And also we have about a total of 691 units in total for, for this area as well, for these developments. Uh, for District 4, we really didn't have any permits. Uh, we did have a custom home that was uh, built next to this park, uh, this site also has an ADU uh, in back as well. District 5, we have uh, one subdivision, uh, Farmstead Square. Uh, we have two, uh, two examples of the type of housing we have there. Uh, you have a total of 130 lots on this site, um, ranging from 3,300 to 6,049 square feet per lot. And lastly, we have District 6, which has a total of six different subdivisions and by far uh, the most diverse different types of housing. Uh, we have Ashton Place, which as you can see, uh, shows uh, the front of the house and the, the back of the house where the garage is located. Um, also, we have South Town, uh, Sterling Chateau, and also we have Vanden Estates, which uh, provides you know another estate type of housing with bigger lots. So. Uh, like I said, uh, diverse housing going anywhere from starter to moderate to executive bigger lot type of houses. And that uh, concludes my part of the presentation. And uh, if you guys have any questions for now, we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, uh, Mr. Lincoln, appreciate it. Um, so, oh, whoops. So we're, we're just pausing right now if you have any questions about the first part of the presentation before we go on to the second part which Tyra will lead on the general plan annual report. So if you have any questions about the Celebrate Housing portion, uh, we'll be happy to entertain those questions now. Otherwise, you get to save it till the very end. Yeah, I don't know if, if um, what I encourage people to do is uh, jot down your, uh, what slide number, because it's great, each slide has a number. Um, that's, that's what I'm doing too. So any burning questions that people have though? Okay, great, take it from here, Josh. So with that said, we'll hand it over to Tyra. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. So as Assistant Director Matamayor had mentioned, tonight we're going to be sharing with you the annual status of the general plan reports. But we want to make sure it's very clear that this report includes an overview of five different documents. The first one being the general plan itself. The second one is the housing element. Then we have two documents that were adopted concurrently with the general plan in 2015. That would include the general plan update, environmental impact report, and the energy and conservation action strategy. I should note that the energy and conservation strategy, also known as ECAS, was originally adopted in 2015, but we've, we've updated since that time and it was adopted in early 2022. Lastly, we have the downtown specific plan. This is the first year we are reporting on the implementation of this plan. Altogether, you can view all the actions, all the policies that are addressed in these five documents as the city's to-do list. This is our work plan throughout the duration of the lives identified within these documents. 
So first, we're just going to do a very high-level review of what, what has occurred regarding the general plan over the past year. We're talking about year 2022. The city has completed two general plan amendments, including the adoption of the vehicle miles traveled or BMT policies. We did this in February of last year. This was a state requirement, and we were one of the first jurisdictions in Solano County to complete this action. We also recently completed the Green Tree Specific Plan. As you may recall, that project did require quite a bit of general plan amendments. That project was approved in November of last year. Currently, we have a handful of pending general plan amendments that include the housing element update, an update to our safety element, and the brand new creation of environmental justice goals, policies, and actions. We are also currently working on the urban reserve analysis. This is to ensure whether or not the city has a 20 year supply of land suitable for residential development. If the council finds that to be true, the city council can then choose whether or not they wanna move forward with converting urban reserve lands to other lands that would support residential development. They can also choose to, I'm sorry, I don't know if I said they don't or they do. The uh, city council can choose to either or not convert urban reserve land depending on our existing housing element or housing inventory itself. In addition to that, we have a pending general plan amendment for the McMur McMurtry Creek Estates located in the northwest portion of Vacaville. We have a general plan amendment pending for North Village specific plan. And lastly, we have a general plan amendment pending for the Park Parish land use, which is located in District 6. Some of the highlights in terms of what we have accomplished in the year 2022 as it relates to general plan implementation includes the city recently updated its land use and development code. We have also adopted our downtown specific plan. Those two projects were adopted on the same night and that was in February of 2022. We are currently drafting our 2023-2031 housing element, which is also known as the sixth cycle housing element. That is not what we're discussing tonight. Tonight, I wanna to emphasize we're really focusing on our existing housing element, which is the fifth cycle and covers 2015 through the year 2022. We have also, bless you, we have also completed uh, the development impact nexus analysis and fee study. So that is reflected in our new building fees. And lastly, the city did participate and approve in the adoption of the Solano County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan. That is one of the documents that we use to feed into our safety element, which will be brought before the Planning Commission later this year. So one of the purposes of the general plan annual status report is to propose priorities for the next year. In this case, we're looking at priorities for the year 2023. The following projects have been identified as priorities and that would be our downtown specific plan implementation, the, uh, the creation of an updated municipal service review and urban reserve land use analysis, our housing element update adoption and implementation of that document, and lastly, the creation of the Northeast Growth Area Specific Plan. So moving along to our housing element, our housing element is one of the mandated chapters of our general plan. That is why we're discussing it tonight. The one thing that really stands out from our housing element as compared to our general plan is it has a mandated update schedule of every eight years, whereas our general plan, it typically gets updated roughly every 20 years or so. So tonight we're gonna to go into some detail in terms of what has been accomplished under our existing housing element. Um, we'll get to that shortly. The few slides I'm gonna show you now is kind of just a brief overview that you might find of interest. Um, we've already mentioned what we're reporting on tonight. We're reporting on the fifth cycle of the housing element. This housing element includes policies to address all income groups. The reports we will be reviewing tonight are based on standardized forms presented or required of the California Department of Housing and Community Development, or HCD for short. And as Assistant Director Montemayor had mentioned, we are required to submit this report to the state every year, no later than April 1st. A submittal of this is required in order to remain eligible for our grant money eligibilities. One second. <laughs> 
kind of grant money? For nearly all grants that the city applies for, whether it be a planning grant, something that we do in community development, or a development for a capital improvement program, or sorry, plan for public works, it is a requirement that you have a certified housing element, and it's also a requirement that you submit your housing element annual progress report every year. If you fail to do either, you are usually deemed immediately ineligible for grant funding. So moving on to our RENA uh, numbers. So as previously mentioned, the housing element is required to address in all income groups. And these groups are all based on how much a household of four makes as it's compared to the Solano County area median income. So what that really means is if the moderate income, well, let me go to the next slide to explain that. So here before you, you have the arena, the regional housing needs allotment for the existing housing element. We were required to plan and prepare for 1,084 new housing units as broken down by the income units or the income groups before you. So with that, we looked at everything that has been issued within this eight year planning period and identified how many units were uh, provided during this time based on those income groups. As you can see, the vast majority of residential permits that were issued um, over this last eight years were affordable to above moderate income households. So this is where we explain really, how do we come up with these income groups? So as I mentioned, the income groups are based on households of four, and it's based on a specific percentage of Solano County's area median income. For 2022, the area median income for Solano County was just under $109,000. Very low incomes make no more than 50% of that total amount, whereas a low income household makes up to 80%. And lastly, moderate income can make up to 120%, and anything beyond that is affordable to above moderate income households. So what does that really look like in Vacaville? This is what it currently looks like in Vacaville. According to the HDD affordability calculator, the maximum cost for an affordable house for a household of four making a moderate income is $403,000. When you look at the median listing prices for homes within Vacaville, you'll see that they range anywhere from $432,000 all the way up to $720,000. Now, one thing I want to point out is the median listing price for Leisure Town Road is the lowest on this chart. However, that is reflective of the smaller house plan footprints. So I just want to make sure that everyone's aware that's a little different than our other subdivisions. So what does that mean for the rental market? So just like we had done for your for sale homes, here we use the same calculator provided to us by HCD to find out what is the maximum affordable rent for a modern, moderate income household. That rent can be no more than $1,800 per month. Currently, the average rental cost in Vacaville is just under $2,300 a month. We have roughly 35% of all the households being rented currently, whereas 65% of all households are owner occupied. To further break down how our rental costs kind of look at a large, at a high level, currently, based on information we had provided or found online, and it was substantiated by more than one website, 77% of all units that are currently being rented in Vacaville are renting for over $2,000. 18% or renting between $1,500 and $2,000. So some of those could be affordable to your moderate income households. And the remaining 5% are renting between $1,000 and $1,500. Some of those might be affordable to our lower income households. So that wraps up that portion of our housing element. We will be revisiting it later in this presentation, but now we're gonna move on to our downtown specific plan. So, as some of you may remember, when we had gone through this process, the whole purpose of our downtown specific plan is to promote a physically 
socially and economically vibrant downtown. The general plan calls out for the creation of the, general, or of the downtown specific plan, and that is why we've included it in our report tonight. So just like we had done with the general plan, we're just gonna kind of hit some of the highlights of what has currently, or what has been completed within our downtown specific plan to date. I would like to note that um, our downtown specific plan was adopted in February of last year. So it's barely a year old, but we are very proud to present to you tonight that several projects have been completed, including, but not necessarily limited to, the installation of directional uh, trailblazer signs. These are the signs you th see throughout the city and they point people to the downtown as well as to other locations within the city. We have completed the Davis Street sign retrofit. That is why you see the sign here. The sign has been retrofitted with LED lighting, thus making it brighter and more energy conscious. Numerous sewer system improvements have already taken place downtown. Partial parking lot improvements have been made. You may have noted most recently that you see these little puck-like devices located within certain parking lots and on Main Street. The whole purpose of that is to alert people who are using a um, mobile device as to where parking is available. And lastly, just for the purpose of tonight's presentation, uh, city staff recently completed a tribal consultation with the Yocha Dehe Wutan Nation. And what this was, it was a partnership with the nation to identify those areas within the city of Vacaville that have anywhere from low to moderate to high cultural resource areas. And in other words, any place that might have something related to the nation with, you know, under the soil. Within the city of Vacaville, it is very well known and very well documented that there are cultural resources mainly along our streams. One of the main reasons for this is because once upon a time, uh, Vacaville, specifically the area downtown, was a village. So knowing that and being able to identify that in map form, we worked with the nation to identify what we call our cultural resources protocols. This alerts not only the uh, city staff, but also the public where it will inform them what they can expect in terms of their project site. Are they in a high resource area or are they in a low resource area? Depending on what's depicted in that map, they have to follow a certain number of protocols in terms of, do they have to hire an archeologist? Must they consult with the nation itself? This is brand new information and the city or the community development department will be the first department to do some training on this. From there, it will be expanded out to the other city department. And ultimately we will be providing this information to the public on the city's website. Pardon me. So moving into projects in progress in downtown. So the city is currently working on the Andrews Park elevated sewer crossing replacement. For anyone familiar with downtown, you probably are familiar with this bridge. If you've ever noticed that there's a pipe affixed to that bridge, that is a sewer line. The sewer line is quite old and our public works department is currently in the process of replacing that with a newer pipe. In addition to that, the city is currently working on doing bank repairs to Lettuce Creek. Uh, phase one of this project includes the area behind the McBride Senior Center. Um, our, economic development our economic development department is currently working with businesses to assist them in terms of you know, making sure that they've got a good working plan, whether or not they can apply or, sorry, noticing them of available uh, grants to uh, improve facades of their buildings, as well as other projects. And also uh, related to economic development, we currently are identifying active storefront incentives to just give the downtown a bit of a facelift. Priority projects, pr um, proposed for 2023 into the year 2024, includes downtown alley paving. This will be just phase one. Um, in this case, we will be replacing some additional sewer pipes within some of the alleys. And once that pipe is replaced, the alleys themselves will be repaved. 
This is of importance because many of our accessory dwelling units are located within downtown and they are typically accessed from these alleyways. City staff will continue to work on a murals program. You may have noticed recently that there was a new mural uh, installed downtown. That was one of the first that uh, city staff worked with a downtown property owner to approve. We would like to formalize this process and thus we will be creating a program to make it simple and clear for other businesses what is required in order to install a mural. We will be working on Eulatus Creek Bank Repairs Phase 2. Phase 2 is the area adjacent to East Main Street in front of Vasquez Deli. We will be working on repairing the School Street Bridge railing. If you're familiar with our School Street Bridge, which dates back to 1911, you'll see that there's a lot of cracks in the railing shown here that will be um, repaired by our Public Works Department. We're going to start an evaluation of our downtown parking lighting. You may recall this was an issue of concern as we worked on our downtown specific plan. We will be um, undergrounding overhead utilities along the park, or the 700 Park project located on East Main. And lastly, there are several water system improvements also proposed. Just some quick notes regarding our ECAS, that's the Energy and Conservation Action Plan. So in March of last year, the City Council approved the Public Works Department to purchase 10 electric buses. In February, uh, as I mentioned previously, we adopted our downtown specific plan. Our downtown specific plan area is a priority development area. And put simply, all of our priority development areas, or PDAs for short, are intended to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by placing a variety of diversified housing downtown or in, actually anywhere where there's transit available and to provide amenities to those new residential units. And lastly, we approved the Allison Affordable Apartments, which would be a 100% affordable project located within our other PDA, which is the Allison PDA, which was shown to you earlier. Just one note regarding our general plan EIR. Um, in December of last year, our building division approved a new code update, building code update. And as part of that, they adopted a green building code. And the green building code identifies several different requirements that further reduces greenhouse gas emissions. I know that was a lot, so we're going to take a little pause here and open it up to the commission if they would like to ask any questions. Um, I, I uh, thank you uh, all for that uh, terrific, well-coordinated, um, meaningful report, um, all three of you. Um, I'd like to um, open it up to the commission for comments, um, uh, starting with Commissioner. So we started down here last time, so we'll start with um, Commissioner uh, Vargas. Yeah. Question on if you could speak to the active uh, storefront incentives, maybe what those look like. Off the top of my head, I don't have them listed. Okay. Um, they are identified in great detail. I believe there's five of them within your packet. <laughs> the one I do recall is there is a program in place currently that does provide small grants for facade improvements. That might be painting, it might be filling in cracks, things of that nature. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Tyra. <clears throat> My question kind of goes to where Mr. Vargas was on the, the facade improvements. What vehicle do you have in place or does the city have in place to take this presentation or this information <laughs> and present to the DBID and the chamber so we get some feedback from the merchants down there of what's already been happening and what's next for them. And you know, it looks like uh, uh, Manager Morris, do you have, or yeah. Aaron? I just wanna share that the city continues to meet, um, to attend the DBID board meetings. And also I saw an email today, but I don't remember all the details, but it appears that a, a committee is convening to also work with the city on looking at downtown improvements and prioritizing those improvements. So I think you can expect in this, this current year, the year 23, there's gonna be a lot more communication uh, with the new downtown Vacaville Business Improvement District, executive director seated 
He's moved to Vacaville. He's here now. And then also there just seems to be a lot of energy um, people from yeah. the city to work with. So. Kind of goes back to telling the story. If yeah. we don't take it to them, then we're in the gray area. Nobody knows what's happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very much, Vice Chair Courtney. <coughs> Commissioner Rodin. Yeah, mine's totally different uh, direction. I like to start with the urban reserve land use analysis. Can this only be reviewed for housing or can commercial be considered? So our general plan identifies the east of Legiontown growth area as being primarily designated for residential development. However, there isn't anything to preclude commercial development. And you may have heard that we do have a, I believe it's a gas station currently proposed within that area. Uh, well, where I'm going with this is that, well, I'm out in District 6, and uh, the need for services is quite high over in that area. It, it's very much just residential housing land out there. And the other consideration that I was thinking about is with One Lake, where do people go to the grocery store that live at One Lake? So to kind of, you know, down that direction of District 6, but then also the northern end of Fairfield, meeting needs down that direction. So that's why I was curious with urban reserve, if, if, it's, if we can only view it in the lens of housing or if we could also view it in the lens of commercial. Second question I have is arena question. So I don't know of any city in the state of California that has actually met the low and very low uh, need. The state understands this, correct? I can say they're aware of it. Okay. Well, I guess aware and understands different story. Um, are there repercussions that, and, and I would imagine for cities that haven't met anything, absolutely. Um, how we have completely just gone above and beyond with the above moderate and moderate housing. And we're also kind of at the mercy of what developers build. Um, are there repercussions for cities that haven't met the low uh, income housing needs or the number? There are not. Okay. The reason for this is the housing element is a planning document. And as a local jurisdiction, we are required by law to provide the opportunity for the creation of the housing units affordable to these different income groups. Right. So once we bring the new housing element to the planning commission in the future, you will see how we are proposing to do that through a myriad of uh, housing programs, as well as identifying specific sites for various income groups. Okay, because, yeah, I'm kind of watching what the state's doing with housing. I mean, I'm already kind of curious what they're going to do in the next and, you know, the seventh cycle. Um, just, it, I mean, they're, they're not messing around. They're very serious about it. And so, but I don't know how many, um, what resources are there for cities? What kinds of funding is coming from the state? Or if it's like, hey, guess what? We want this. Good luck. Um, so I was just kind of curious on that one. That's a great question. <laughs> All for me. Thank you, staff, for the presentation. Fantastic. I just want to uh, make a comment. Um, recently at the State of the Base, the commander um, of Travis Air Force Base, his number one priority was local housing for the servicemen and women. So I want to make sure we keep that in mind. Um, Travis Air Force Base is a $3 billion entity to Solano County, and it would be, we would be mindful to make sure we take the direction of the Air Force Base into consideration with what we're planning and what we plan to do. So I just wanted to make sure we made that, I made that comment. Does Seth want to receive that comment or comment on that? Oh, sure, we absolutely can. So state law requires us to address special groups. Special groups ranges from everything, including people who may have either physical or mental disabilities. It can include, include seniors. It can include uh, female-headed households. It can include large great thing about state law is it also allows local jurisdictions to identify special groups for themselves. The existing housing element as well as the draft housing element that will be brought to this planning commission again later this year, we have identified Travis Air Force Base as a special group, understanding its local importance to the overall economy. Thank you, um, John. Um, so I, I do have uh, just a, I'll, I'll keep my questions brief. Um, the uh, main issue I, I wanted to flag was um, it, it seems as though you had included on slide 21 um, 
uh, thing that did not include EJ. Uh, so it, it looks like in the overview, um, uh, if you can get to slide 21 for or actually, you know what, it might be slide 24, I apologize. Um, yes, so support includes, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't see, where does environmental justice fit on this page? So um, as a reminder, we are currently reporting on the existing housing elements and we're reporting on the existing general plan as it exists today. As part of the next housing elements, and as well as part of the amendments being proposed to our general plan, that's where we're bringing in the environmental justice goals, policies, and actions. So as of today, those have not yet been adopted, and therefore we don't report on those. Gotcha. Yeah, and um, I uh, it's not lost on me. I just it's important to um, I, I didn't want to lose sight of it because I know that uh, you were discussing it um, uh, after that. But the so. If we're keeping track of the development of the of the city's EJ program, it's going to be um, forthcoming. Then it will. In okay. fact, I'm, I'll just if it's okay, I'll take a moment just to let the plan commission know that very soon you will be receiving a flyer and notification of upcoming public outreach meetings. We are proposing one on March seventh. That'll be a virtual online meeting of, open to everyone who would like to participate. On March 8th, we're going to be having an in-person meeting, and we're going to be having it in the heart of the uh, Rocky Martin, or Markham, uh, Mar sorry, I said backwards, Mark Markham Rocky Hill area at the Boys and Girls Club. So we'll be having those two, and as though that's not enough, we will be presenting an informational presentation to the Planning Commission on March 21st. At the March 21st meeting, not only are we going to review the environmental justice goals, policy, and actions, we're also going to be providing some information regarding the safety elements. Gotcha. And um, I had previously asked about uh, trees and density as a, a measure of health. Um, is there anything more about that uh, that we could expect to see as well? You can. In fact, the draft safety element, as well as the draft um, environmental justice goals, policies, and actions are currently available on the city's website. So there is a policy regarding trees. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, that's all for me. So with that, unless there's other questions, uh, thank Mr. you. Chairman, Please. we do have a handful of additional slides. Okay. Yep, Tyra, we're, that, that, we're good. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, We're good. So that concludes the presentation. Um, this is just an annual report that's received by the state by April 1st of every year. So this is just routine. Um, if there's no other questions, we can move on to the next uh, item on our agenda. So motive B. Okay, great. So I will now introduce the next part of the agenda, which is the California 2023 Housing Laws Memorandum. In your packet, you'll find a memo uh, that staff has prepared on the California um, laws that came into that would come into effect this year as prepared by the law firm Holland and Knight and it provides a comprehensive list of the new housing laws um, that went into effect this year so we don't have any specific information on the laws but what we will do is if there's anything that flags your interest we'll go ahead and note those down and we'll come back to the next meeting with more information but this is just a receive memorandum Commissioner Rudin. Okay, I have a couple that if you don't mind taking notes or who am I, who am I looking at? Who am I? Um, you're... For, oh, so are we, are we just receiving this or is this something that we can uh, request a little feedback on the upcoming? Well, okay, so yeah, I'll just to specify we're in item B. Um, I, I neglected, excuse me, sorry. Um, so this is California's 2023 housing laws memorandum, and uh, this we continue to receive the report from staff on this. But um, the um, this is to receive the memo and uh, provide some background um, on this from the staff. So we're looking for here, um, Commissioner Rudin, if, if you wanted to add your comments now, it's, it's completely up to you. Yeah. Please. Okay. So one that I'm curious about is. Um, 
let's just look around, is AB 2097, the, um, the parking requirements of public, uh, within a half mile of public transit. It's not the parking requirements that I'm, I'm concerned about. It's more of, I remember a couple years back, there was a bill by Senator Weiner that had to do with transit centers. And there were specific criteria on what a transit center was by the number of like buses and whatever that showed up. So this said, and I even looked up the law itself and it, it just specified a, uh, I written down, I don't think it said transit center. I think it was just public, it's public transportation. Does this include a bus stop? So I don't have specific information on that, but Dr. Morris does. But that's, that, that's kind of what I'm curious if. That, that we'll note that one and we'll bring back more information. I, okay. I remember that law you're referring to, which yeah. had to do with the frequency of the transit at the station over a 24 hour period. And uh, we'll dig into this one a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because I was curious about that because when I was down in Gilroy, it wouldn't have affected anywhere because we didn't have enough buses or anything like that. But I think the language has gotten a little looser. So just curious. And then also the other one I was curious about was with AB 2094 and AB 2653. This is going to require uh, greater requirements for annual reports on housing. What kind of impact is that going to have on you guys? No, not no really. I mean, I'm serious. It's probably not really an impact, right? You guys are ready to go. Probably an even bigger report. Than the yeah, no, but I mean, tonight. that's what I would imagine is that it's going to be a lot more in depth. And it's, you know, what kind of strain is that going to be on you guys? So. I mean, just kind of curious. I mean, I can't offer more than my sympathy, but so that's kind of about it for me. <laughs> Don't like my wife. <laughs> right. Um, uh, uh, th thank you, Commissioner Rudin. Um, did staff, did, did, did any other, any others want to add to receiving those comments from Commissioner Rudin before we move on to other comments? I won't talk anymore. No, I mean, I, I, I just want to make sure that everyone's got a chance to weigh in. Um, Commissioner Wilkerson, did you have uh, any comments before we move? Not regarding the game, but on some other things. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, AB uh, 2295, allowing educational employment housing on land owned by school districts and county office of education. Um, and AB uh, 2873, promoting diversity and affordable housing de uh, development. I mean, it's always diversity and equity is always something that's talked about, right? And it's always that nice key buzzword, but, you know, actually seeing something on the books potentially would be good. So um, those, are, those, would be, those are my two. Um. So uh, what the, the next step for this report, uh, for, for this memo, um, Josh, what, what is the next step? Yeah, so no action is required this evening. We've noted which policies, um, I'm sorry, which laws you would like to hear back on. So we'll report back at an upcoming meeting on each of these in more detail. Okay, thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll move to uh, our next item, Director Morris' report. Uh, Item A, City Council Actions Pertaining to uh, Commission Activities. Uh, thank you, Chair Klein and members of Commission. Uh, since the last uh, Planning Commission meeting in early December, uh, the Council's had a few meetings. Um, the first one on December 13th was when the Council approved second readings of the ordinances for the Green Tree Project, the Northeast Growth Area Zoning Code Amendments, um, and also the California Building Code um, update. Uh, that was actually a very good evening. For those items, um, North Village was considered at that meeting and it was again continued to address some issues that the council wanted to see um, further explored by the applicant. And we're still working on bringing that back to council probably in March of, of this year. And then on uh, January 1st, possibly of interest to this commission, because it will come before you eventually, uh, the council entered into an exclusive negotiating agreement with um, Menard Energy um, for the Gibson Canyon water treatment uh, facility uh, to explore battery storage at that location. So it's not an approved project. It's a agreement that the city's entered into to explore that land use on that site. Um, and that is something that is now kicking off. Um, just we haven't even dug into it, but on the face of it, it will requ would require general plan amendment, rezoning, CEQA, all kinds of things that will ultimately come to the commission as part of the process should the project move into a, a formal process. So I just want to get that one on your radar. 
Um, and then if it's okay, Mr. Chair, I can roll into item B, tentative schedule of future planning commission items. <clears throat> Looking ahead, our next meeting will probably have, as Tyra mentioned, the environmental justice um, presentation and also the urban reserve. And we are also now dedicated to figuring out what else we're gonna bring you. Um, at this point, we do anticipate having meetings every month uh, through summer. So keep your calendars free. And we'll, we'll try to bring interesting things to you. And then if we can roll to item C, the department activity report, the advanced planning update is going to be provided by Ms. Hayes over there. And then the current planning update, I believe by Mr. Bavant. Okay. So you've heard quite a bit about what's currently happening, happening in advanced planning. So one of the biggest items we're currently working on is the draft housing element. We submitted the draft housing element to HCD for the first time in October, and we're proud to announce that we will be resubmitting it to HCD for its second review um, in just two days on the 23rd. So the second review is a mandatory 60-day review. We're hoping to get that back in time to go ahead and schedule the housing element for its uh, public hearings in late spring, early summer. Concurrently with the housing element, we are preparing the safety element, which I currently, or I had previously mentioned, is available online. The draft safety element will be brought back before the Planning Commission on March 21st. It'll be an informational item, so it is an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. And the same goes for our environmental justice goals, policies, and actions. So we will be bringing that back to the Planning Commission March 21st. But as I previously mentioned, we will be having two community outreach meetings, one on March 7th, that's a virtual meeting. The other one is March 8th, and that'll be an in-person meeting. Um, I did fail to mention that the second draft of the housing element is also currently available on the city's website if you would like to take a look at it. That is mainly what we've been focusing on. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, so I'll just go um, by district in terms of the activities for current planning. Uh, district one, uh, no new projects or approvals. Uh, in terms of plan checks, um, we received some plan checks regarding some of the industrial um, areas, some of the warehouse buildings, some of those um, areas in particular. Uh, Kaiser Permanente had some TIs, and uh, North Village Unit 7 had some plot plans that were, uh, that were reviewed as well. Uh, District 2, um, we got a new application for Home Depot to expand their um, rentals, uh, rental uh, element, I guess. Um, it's a rental center. And that was the only application received for District 2 in terms of plan checks, uh, a lot of uh, plot plans for a single family home development uh, around the city. Uh, District 3, uh, we received a new application for Centennial Park uh, lighting. So this is a proposal by the city to uh, install a new uh, ball field lighting for both Centennial and Arlington, which I'll get to as well. Uh, those are CIP projects. Uh, we will be having uh, a neighbor meeting for each one of those projects. Um, right now, they're supposed to be tentatively um, late March and early, uh, early April. In terms of plan checks for District 3, um, payless towing, which the Planning Commission reviewed uh, last year, uh, they are in plan check. And that is really it, except for some uh, minor uh, dry rot repair and roofing plan checks. Uh, for District 4, no new projects or approvals. Um, and again, some minor residential uh, permit activity. Uh, for District 5, no new projects or approvals. Uh, plot plans for Farmstead were reviewed. And um, I think those are it for that district. And then District 6, Arlington Park, um, that's the other CIP project where it gets, they're, they're both the same uh, lighting uh, proposal and we'll have a neighbor meeting for that one as well. Um, in terms of plan checks, again, a lot of uh, house plans, plot plans for, for different subdivisions around the city. Thank you. Yeah, you know, nothing sexy. I, I can help you with sexy. <laughs> um, real sexy issues, transportation, transit, and bike plans in the one. Um, specifically, but I'm clear, curious about our bike plans, you know, more generally. Um, there are certain um, areas, stretches, where it's very difficult to discern what the city's master plan is for biking. 
around the city, particularly in, in District 1, where there's a lot of goods movement and um, unkept pavement uh, for bikes. Uh, particularly, there's a bridge, an overpass for 505 that um, a small child could easily fall over on to 505, and it's a two-lane road. And I don't know what the bike plan is there. So can you just give me an idea? Because I know that um, a couple of meetings, maybe six months ago, we heard that there are more um, warehouses approved uh, in District 1 for expansion, I think, of a marble, you know, some maybe it's a marble warehouse across the street from a hotel that's being built. Um, so, you know, I'm keeping an eye on that. Just, just letting you know, like, what I'm interested in, I know others have interests, um, and it's not just about, like, you know, my wish list or anyone, but I wouldn't do my job if I didn't tell you that people are, you know, telling me what's the plan for biking, and I, I personally have observed <clears throat> it as well, so I'm just curious about those two things, um, bike master plan and uh, cohesion with uh, goods movement and District 1, specifically adjacent to that hotel and the overpass where it's a two lane bridge and a small child could easily fall off. Um, so I can give sort of general response to me perhaps at our next meeting, come back with some more uh, detailed information. So uh, in, in April, you'll be reviewing the CIP uh, list for the upcoming year. And that has a lot of the projects that the city has funding for or anticipated funding for. And that should give you an idea of what the city is gonna be looking at for construction. And certainly, um, your comments on that will be forwarded on to council as they review it too. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you have that opportunity to please, you know, tell us exactly how you feel about the project you're seeing and um, what you would like to see uh, as a commissioner. Um, in terms of, there's also a project underway for um, improvements to the 505 interchange, or I'm sorry, um, flyover. And so that's right now some that the staff is reviewing and there is an environmental document that we'll be reviewing. So that's slowly uh, moving along. Uh, those are the two projects that I know of, uh, two items that I know that might be of interest to you in those, uh, for those items. But um, just generally speaking, when we look at new development, we'll certainly keep that in mind in terms of your concerns about connectivity and, and sort of pedestrian protection. Active transportation uh, is really what we're trying to get to uh, in that area. And there's tension, obviously, because it's developing, but I, I really, um, I don't want, I just didn't want to extend this. I know you, no one came prepared to talk about this. So I don't expect any information about it. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, Tyra? If I may add on to Planning Manager Bavon's uh, comment. So currently, Public Works is seeking grant funding for a master bicycle and pedestrian plan. We are also working along with the Solano Transportation um, Authority currently when they begin work later this year on their active transportation plan to make sure that their ATP plan is consistent with our future bicycle and pedestrian plan. And just a note, there is a requirement in the general plan that does call out for the creation of the master plan for pedestrians and bicycles. Yeah, I'm just so frightened about that 505 over. It's, 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 a, it's a, an accident waiting to happen. It, it, it's terrible. It's not for swirl. So um, yeah, um, that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, Director Morris, sorry. Um, I guess back onto our agenda topic. Thank you. Um, the last item in my director's report are announcements. I just have one. Uh, the planning commissioner's conference in Garden Grove is coming up. I have heard from one commissioner who would like to attend if there's space, and I'm checking on that. If any of you are free um, and either are on the cusp of possibly being reappointed or know you're definitely continuing, um, let me know because we still have that one spot. And I just want to make sure it's either available to a new incoming commissioner or someone who's on this with this group that would like to participate. Uh, Commissioner Radine and I will be there. We're looking for one. I think that was the only other announcement I had. So, and you're, people are welcome to pay for themselves to go, right? Actually, the challenge is that they've they, every year they sell out, and we reserve these seats months and months ago with the budget I have. We are going to check to see if there are any open slots, but I've been disappointed every time I've tried to do a late registration. It's a very small conference. Yeah, you got to register, but if you want to pay, you can pay in for your own hotel and everything, and uh, if if. Uh, you're on, on the fence, maybe, is what I'm saying. Well, you, but you can't go to the conference because they sell out. They don't have any slots to offer, usually. I'm checking on that, though. Okay. Typically, they just they, they close the doors after they get a certain number of registrants. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that uh, people, if you, so, so the cost of registration is, is limited to just two people. 
No, it's the number. The it's the number. They only have a certain number of seats for this conference, which is a statewide conference, and they sell out typically months ahead of the conference because people like me reserve the seats for which we have the budget as soon as we have that budget, as soon as they announce the registration opportunity. So that's that's why I'm going to check, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's sold out. I'm sure you can just show up. I, I mean, because I, I remember last time, uh, is this the same conference that we all went to? I, I'm just trying to remember. This is the same is, one, yeah. right? It wasn't like the Beatles weren't there. I mean, it was, it, although it. It's from Tech Sub Up for tickets. Sub Up, <laughs> Ticketmaster. Well, there were, there were particular workshops that we could find. Of course. <laughs> I, now, now I know the racket that the the, the grift the, the two of you are running. Oh no, it's, I didn't even know last year. Right. So yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, um, with that, we'll uh, move to Commissioner Comments. Um, Commissioner Wilkerson. Thank you. Um, couple things. Just happy Black History Month. Um, and as we take a moment to reflect on that. Just want to talk about a community event that happened last month. Uh, the Vacable People's Forum put on the Martin Luther King Jr. event. Um, it was a great event. Um, I attended, and I want to commend Commissioner uh, Isha Gutierrez, Councilmember Greg Ritchie, the Solano Black Chamber for their incredible work on this um, impactful event. The city of Vacaville was very well represented. And it was great to see everybody come together regarding uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. During the event, I spoke with some attendees um, most minorities regarding uh, the issues they're facing and a topic that comes up a lot is financial literacy. And it's very concerning when we look at the numbers of home ownership declining in the African American sector. We're the lowest sector right now, it's could be continuing declining through the state of California. So I would hope that there are other programs and issues that could come together and really discuss minority home ownership and, and, and projects and, and things that are out there for them. Speaking on that, I want to talk recently, um, the California Association of Realtors publicly acknowledged that their past support of discriminatory housing policies and promised action to support equal access to housing in the future. This is an important step to creating a more just and equitable housing market. So previously, the associations were backing discriminatory laws back in the 60s. And so last year, they came out with an apology letter um, stating what they did was wrong, and they were on record stating that. And so, um, you know, as a community, we still have a lot to do to combat discrimination, especially in housing, and I just urge us all to work together. Um, other note quickly, you know, state of the base, they talked about housing, um, very important to them, and local um, amenities for uh, the airmen to do. So I'd love to see Vacaville have taken an opportunity to bring an attraction here, right? Like back in the day, and don't judge me on this, but the Woos was an attraction. Stop it. The Woos was an attraction that people would come to. I'm not saying we need to bring the Woos back. In fact, I'm not. Uh, I, I'll go on record and say no. But I would like to see. I, I am aging myself. But guess what? You were working the Woos when I was walking through the Woos. <laughs> Correct? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but just just an attraction for Vacaville. We talk about no um, some something that could bring bring people here as a destination as opposed to just we're always traveling out to do things. Obviously downtown's going to have something nice, but I'd love to see Vacaville do something. And then lastly, I attended Councilmember Silva's event. Um, great event he had. I appreciated him and his community outreach. And it was at a new restaurant for me that I went to, and I enjoyed it. So. I would just like to see um, more of us at events throughout. I know I see uh, Commissioner Lightfoot at a bowl-a-thon um, back in December, and um, there I, I did see him and his family in, uh, engaging in bowling, and I do not believe he was the winner um, with regards to his household, but I'll let him, if he wants to speak on that and further clarify that. Um, I'll just leave it up to you on that. But just a couple events that were going on. A, a lot's going on in Vacaville. A lot's happening. But I'd like to see us see more of us at events. That's really what I'm coming down to. So I thank you all for your time. Sorry, we're long with it.
quite sure how to follow that other than in my district, there will be this Thursday, a virtual meeting about Park Parish. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, comment about that, that it'll be this Thursday, it's virtual. Check the city's webpage for details. Brilliant. Park, Park Parish? Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's a small, roughly two acre commercial zone in the South Town uh, uh, neighborhood. I mean, of course, I knew that, but I knew so not everyone would know. Um, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Courtney. No comments. I want to piggyback off of Commissioner Wilkerson's and look forward to engaging in that conversation about housing opportunities for our airmen at Travis and making sure that housing is, or Travis is not on the BRAC list in the future because of housing, and that we have the opportunity. I know in that speech that was given, they were, our airmen, quality of life is the largest component or one of the most important things for our airmen out of Travis coming from leadership there and that our airmen are now having to drive to Sacramento or farther for housing. So it affects their quality of life. So make sure that we have that conversation soon about opportunities for housing. And I, I don't want to get too uh, a field of our commissioner comments, but I do want to say it would be nice to know what the how, how to tailor? Well, our, hopefully like, in our discussions know. about that, we can ask you to bring that back because we don't know. I mean, I think they recently have gone through a housing allowance increase, so it would be nice for us to know all, all, all the aboves and how you can engage with Travis to get that information to us. Thank you, Vice Chair Courtney. Um, I'll uh, piggyback on um, all of the good comments that were made. Um, I particularly, uh, Meant that came to mind when Commissioner Wilkerson was talking was um, the text uh, "Color of Law." If anyone's read that, um, it it really uh, puts into the academic, the environmental um, law um, movement. Um, uh, it's almost like a chronology of um, of why environmental justice is important, and in particular, uh, the redlining and discriminatory housing policies that um, have their place in that chronology, um, it, it's as good a time as any, um, you know, it's just a month, but it could be a year of it. Um, but, you know, just being aware of um, the impacts that has generational wealth. So I absolutely agree with Commissioner Wilkerson's comments, financial literacy um, is an ongoing issue, um, largely because of, uh, you know, land use policies that were flawed um, based on de jure racism. Um, but thank you for that. Um, with that, um, Commissioner Lightfoot, any comments? Comment on bowling after that. <laughs> <laughs> any comments on bowling, Commissioner Lightfoot? Just kidding. Did you win? Who won? Okay, I will say um, my wife did beat me in bowling. She's she's a wonderful bowler, but I did outscore all of my children. <laughs> <laughs> Father of the year. <laughs> Uh, Director Morris, uh, to, your, to you and your staff, a uh, phenomenal presentation tonight. I appreciate that. I did take particular interest in small business assistance, and I think for, for all of us, just sustainability of small businesses, in particular downtown, always a concern. They come, they go. Uh, with their, uh, vacancy rate downtown Vacaville is quite high, in my opinion, uh, and so I'm, I'm certain that you all are, are looking into that. Um, I do want to put in a plug for Councilman Silva tonight. Um, he and the Health Education Council hosted a meeting at Markham, which was, which is the uh, Markham Neighborhood Association, uh, with the hope of it spreading to other districts, but starting in District 3. I did razz him when we were at the uh, Chinese New Year celebration for uh, Chinese American Association of Solano County, and I said, can you not schedule these things on the day that we have planning commission meetings? Because I cannot go. So uh, nonetheless, I, I, they're in spirit and certainly support the things that he's doing and having an opportunity to speak with folks from the Health Education Council. They certainly are vested in not just Vacaville or Markham in general, um, but just in Solano County. So thank you. Thank you for a very good meeting. Um, the guys get better every time, but uh, the, the team is uh, starting to 
like knock it out. So um, you were doing great before, but we're, we're glad that we're getting out of here before nine. Um, I guess with that, uh, we're adjourned to our next meeting. Uh, good night. So the color of rock. Yeah. Richard Lewis.